Hello again, everyone. Um, this is Adam with Ocean Conservancy. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we are here today to learn from Ivy Fredrickson, staff attorney for Ocean Conserv Conservancy, and Reggie Peros, our government relations manager, one of our government relations managers, um, about ocean conservation and fisheries, sustainable fisheries and ocean conservation, and how and why that might be of importance to people who care about the ocean but are inland and near the Great Lakes, uh, our nation's great inland seas. Um, Ivy will go first and then we'll hand it over to Reggie. Thank you again for joining us, Ivy. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name, as Adam said, my name is Ivy Fredrickson. I'm a staff attorney at Ocean Conservancy. I've been with the organization since 2011 and have been working on federal fish issues since the early 2000s. Um, so happy you all could join us today. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the presentation so that we can leave enough room at the end for questions. Oh, and my computer seems to have froze. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, here's a quick, quick outline of our presentation for today. First, I'm going to provide some context on why we should all care about fish and fisheries, even if we aren't located near the ocean. I'm actually located in Montana. Then I'm going to talk about fishery management, marine fishery management under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Then my colleague Reggie will jump in to explain the threats that the law and our sustainable fishery management system are currently facing. Interestingly, some very important congressional voices on this issue come from the inland states, so there's a clear and urgent need for advocacy on this issue, and it's especially timely because we recently learned that there was going to be some action on one of the bills next week. Um, so ecosystem roles of fish. Fish play an incredibly important set of roles in ocean ecosystems. They are predators and prey. They link ecosystems and provide food for iconic species. They're herbivores that keep coral reefs clean. They can also have impacts on ecosystems by doing things like contributing to the cycling of nutrients or regulating food web dynamics. Fish are important for people too. For us, fish are food, recreation, and employment. Based on the latest NOAA data, U.S. fisheries generate $208 billion in sales impacts and 1.62 million jobs in 2015. This includes both commercial and recreational fisheries. Fishing is a way of life in many coastal communities. It's a cultural identity. And of course, fishing provides opportunities for recreation and tourism. For those of us who don't live near the ocean, healthy fisheries provide us with the opportunity to eat fresh seafood, even though we may be thousands of miles away from the coast. Americans consume 15.5 pounds of seafood per year per capita. The U.S. now ranks as the second largest consumer of seafood in the world after China and before Japan. Seafood from healthy U.S. fisheries can help meet growing demand domestically and worldwide. And we want our seafood to be sustainable. There's increasing interest in this. In a survey, over half of Americans said it was important to them that the seafood they purchase is sustainably caught. 22% of Americans said that they would be willing to pay between 10 to 20 percent more for sustainably caught seafood. And it may be obvious to, to some, but it's not to others. Um, fish, are, fish in our oceans are a public resource. They belong to everyone. They belong to you and they belong to me. Think of them as the animals in our national forest, or think of timber, or deer, or ducks, or trout. Everyone should have a stake in their management. We need to ensure that we have fishery resources for generations to come. Um, but easier said than done. Uh, managing fish is a really hard job. It's hard for a few reasons. First, these things are underwater. They're often really, really far underwater. There's an inherent perception issue when you switch from something you can readily see with the naked eye, like deer or ducks, to something beneath the surface. The science behind counting fish that we can't see is very complicated, and there's often uncertainty over how many fish there actually are. Another complicating factor is that unlike terrestrial animals, fish are caught by both recreationists and by commercial operations. This is one of the only situations where there's a wild hunt and a commercial hunt for the same species. And then there's a whole host of other factors such as environmental conditions, climate change, and variations in fish population size from year to year. So it's really complicated. So everyone has to work in a coordinated fashion and that's very challenging. Okay, moving on to a little bit about the law. Uh, what is the Magnuson-Stevens Act and how should we think about it? The original law was passed in 1976, which might make you think it's one of those classic 70s environmental laws, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, NEPA. 
It's really not. Originally, this was an industry protection statute. The goal was to kick the foreign boats out of U.S. waters and make sure that the domestic fishermen could get the fish instead. Uh, the original law contained conservation objectives, and it acknowledged that overfishing was occurring and needed to be addressed, but it was all in a pretty loose fashion. But as we've learned in the last 40 years of proactively managing ocean fisheries, the best way to protect both fish, both the recreational and the commercial industries, is to protect, protect the fish that they target. The Magnuson Act has evolved over the years to double down on conservation measures and strong science provisions because that is how you keep fisheries viable. You need decent habitat. You need to let fish reach their reproductive ages, and you need to set limits on how many fish can be removed so that there are some fish to catch in years to come. Um, so a little bit about the timeline of the law and reauthorizations. I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but bear with me. Um, after the original law passed in 1976, a core problem was identified. Despite the requirements to rebuild and end over fishing, management decisions often put short-term economic considerations ahead of long-term conservation. Uh, then the, by 1996, there was a need to, to tighten those, those measures. The 1996 amendments beefed up the overfishing and re rebuilding requirements. The 1996 language included the rebuilding timeline requirement that remains in the law today. That's that the time period for rebuilding must be as short as possible and not to exceed 10 years unless certain exceptions apply. Um, these are if the biology of the stock of fish or environmental conditions prevent the maximum time frame from being met. Then fast forward another decade. Um, in 2006, Congress added teeth to the overfishing language and ensured that it was science-based. Basically, this is when Congress said, no, we really, really mean it. You must end overfishing immediately. You must use annual catch limits and accountability measures to make sure it actually happens. And in this reauthorization, the scientists were given a much bigger role in setting the catch levels. So both the original bill and the subsequent reauthorizations in 96 and 2006 had broad bipartisan support. Now, after all this time, over 40 years, the Magnuson Act has become a landmark piece of environmental legislation. It's right up there with, um, with the Endangered Species Act, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, NEPA, in terms of conservation value for our oceans. So a little more here about how the law actually works. The Magnuson-Stevens Act is guided by 10 national standards. These are things like preventing overfishing, using the best available science, not discriminating against fishermen from different states, minimizing bycatch, promoting the safety of life at sea. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the best available science requirement is, note, is noteworthy. Science comes into play through the stock assessment process and in setting, setting the catch limits. The councils cannot exceed the levels recommended by their expert scientists. The main management vehicle under the law is the, the Fishery Management Plan, or FMP. These are written regionally, and their components are defined by the law. NOAA Fisheries tracks and manages 474 species in 46 fishery management plans. So there's a whole lot of moving parts and a whole lot of fish. Um, here's a map of the regional councils. The Magnuson Act empowers regional fishery management councils, comprised primarily of fishermen and state representatives, to develop customized management solutions that meet their needs while achieving the minimum requirements for conservation. <clears throat> uh, keep in mind that this law manages federal waters, so that's three to 200 nautical miles offshore, and states manage their own waters under three miles. This is a unique management system in which the users get a lot of say. The eight regional councils write the fishery management plans, and NOAA Fisheries acts as the backstop to ensure it complies with the law. The parties who use and need the resource the most have to keep it viable. So this arrangement allows the regional councils to manage their fish based on regional needs and regional expertise. Uh, the Magnuson Act has a lot of goals. It's a very long law, but there's, there's two, two main things. Um, well, the overarching goal is to balance the fish taken out or killed today against the fish needed in the future. And to do this, there's two main conservation objectives. The first is to prevent overfishing of fish populations with science-based catch limits. These are limits on catch that prevent fishermen from taking more fish this year than nature can replace. The second is to rebuild depleted fish populations to help ensure the long-term sustainability. The hard part here, of course, is how you do that. How do we achieve these objectives and what factors do we need to consider as we balance today's needs against future needs? 
Um, so here's a slide about what the law does and doesn't do. There's a common misconception that the MSA is too prescriptive and lacks flexibility, and that's just not true. It doesn't require any specific types of management. It doesn't dictate, sci dictate scientific resources. It doesn't really require all species to be, to be rebuilt within 10 years. In fact, more than half of all rebuilding plans have a schedule that's longer than the 10-year default timeline. The average time for rebuilding is 26 years. And it doesn't dictate allocations of fish between fishing sectors. So how successful has the law been? It's actually been really successful. Um, it's now a model for, you, for fishery management around the world. It's really turned the U.S. fisheries around. Since 2000, the percentage of stocks that are subject to overfishing has dropped by 63%. The percentage of stocks that are overfished has dropped by 61%. And 44 uh, fish stocks have been rebuilt back to healthy levels. Uh, but there are still a lot of challenges. Fishery management is really tricky, as I explained. There are different regions, and the different parts of the industry in those different regions often have conflicting goals, and what works in one region simply will not work in another. Therefore, the Magnuson Act keeps things pretty high level in order to give regions and different fisheries the flexibility to make things work for them. It's only prescriptive when it has to be. It's really a, a classic tragedy of the common situation. You have to have scientific catch limits or you'll choose short-term game over long-term viability. We all do it. But after 40 years of growing commercial and recreational fisheries, we've figured out that if you don't have tight controls on ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks, then it just won't happen. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Reggie to explain some of the threats to the law. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for being on our webinar today. Um, so like Ivy said, uh, my name is Reggie Peros and I'm on the federal government relations team here at Ocean Conservancy. And I work uh, mostly on defending the Magnuson-Stevens Act from its various threats in Congress. Uh, and like Ivy just mentioned, uh, because marine fishery management is very tricky, there are those who want the law to be more flexible and to remove the tight controls on ending overfishing and rebuilding unhealthy stocks. Uh, despite the success of the legislation, uh, there are proposals in Congress that would remove many of the successful provisions of the MSA and roll back the progress that we've made. Uh, the Magnuson Act is now being politicized by frustrated special interest groups who really want to bring the act to its knees instead of working together in a bipartisan manner to improve it. Uh, and so the first threat that we want to talk about is H.R. 200, uh, which was introduced this year by Congressman Don Young of Alaska. Uh, this bill specifically would remove the requirement for annual catch limits for potentially hundreds of species. Uh, it, the bill would lengthen the time to rebuild fish stocks, uh, so it would delay the benefits that we receive from rebuilding uh, and leave stocks at unhealthy levels for longer. Uh, and it would undermine some really key bedrock environmental laws by either circumventing the processes in them or putting them within the Magnuson management process, uh, which we firmly disagree with. H.R. 200 has passed out of the Natural Resources Committee uh, along a party line vote, uh, which is drastically different from the bipartisan pro-conservation changes that were made to the law in the past. Uh, and like Ivy mentioned earlier, uh, we actually just got notice uh, that um, the bill is actually going to be on the floor of the House next week. Uh, and so in a few slides, Adam, our colleague, is going to talk about how you can help us now by encouraging your member of Congress to vote no against this bill. And so uh, the second bill that we're going to talk about um, is on uh, the other side of Congress, uh, and that's in the Senate. Um, and that is S-1520, uh, which is the Modern Fish Act. And it was introduced by Senator Wicker of Mississippi. Uh, this bill does not reauthorize the Magnuson Act uh, and instead is, in focus, is focused on loosening management of recreational fisheries. And I think we're trying to get the PowerPoint to catch up here. Yeah, sorry, it uh, <laughs> seems to have frozen on me. Let me try to escape out. <laughs> What's going on here? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, back on track. All right. 
Perfect. There we go. So S1520, uh, this is the Modern Fish Act, which, like I just mentioned, was introduced by Senator Roger Wicker of uh, Mississippi. Uh, this bill does not actually reauthorize the Magnuson Act uh, and instead is focused on loosening management of recreational fisheries. And so specifically, this bill would authorize management measures for recreational fisheries that could cause confusion and may not be compatible with the science-based management in which we manage our fisheries right now. The bill would also force frequent and unnecessary reviews of catch allocation between commercial and recreational sectors, uh, which would be a really big burden for all of the regional councils that have a lot of other important decisions to make. Uh, and it would also create barriers to implementing catch shares, which is a management tool that has worked in some fisheries. Um, it really limits the options for both fishermen and the regional managers that are in charge of managing those fisheries. Uh, like HR 200, um, S1520 has been reported uh, out of its committee, so the Senate Commerce Committee approved the bill um, with some significant opposition from a lot of key senators who have championed sustainable fishery management in the past. Uh, and also similarly to the House, we're expecting movement on this bill sometime in the next few weeks as well. So it's really important that if you're interested in engaging on this issue, we could really use your help. And so finally, I want to provide some key takeaways uh, before we turn it over to our colleague, Adam, who's going to talk a little bit about what you can do to help us engage on these issues. Uh, and so as we finish up, we wanted to really leave you with four key takeaways. Um, the fish have benefits for the environment and for us, for humans, uh, for people. It's critical now that we get fishery management right so that they can keep providing benefits for now and in the future. The Magnuson Act is a really good framework to get management right. It has led to progress in managing our fisheries, and it has made the U.S. model uh, really a fishery management model for the rest of the world. The Magnuson Act is threatened by proposed legislation in both the House and the Senate, and this has some really big ramifications for other bedrock environmental laws. Uh, and we will continue to need to protect and defend U.S. fish populations and build upon our current successes. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our colleague, Adam Missler, who's going to talk about uh, how we can use your help in order to safeguard uh, our fisheries and our fishermen. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Reggie, and thank you, Ivy. Um, as Reggie was saying, uh, one proposal in Congress that would roll back the progress we as a nation have made in fisheries management will be voted on just next week in the House. Um, and it wouldn't just roll back fisheries management provisions that have been very important. Uh, it would undermine core environmental, other core environmental laws like NEPA, both in the House and in the Senate, where the legislation could be looked at very soon as well. Um, the, the two bills face opposition, um, and you as people, as a community, can help uh, can help that opposition and can help uh, counteract the, these bills and the bad provisions in them. Um, and going back to what Ivy said, some of the very important voices on this issue come from the inland and Great Lakes states. Um, Ocean Conservancy will be following up this presentation with uh, guidance and contact information uh, as well as social media information for uh, a bevy of Great Lakes members. Um, the, the small toolkit of sorts will also include uh, social media guidance and messaging, as well as um, potential content for emails you might send to your members. Uh, again, we will be sending that out uh, tomorrow. And if you have any questions and need any help, if we do not uh, address your member in the information that we send out and you want to reach out, we would love to help you uh, and please email me at any time.